Welcome to First Mover, your first global look at today's action in the Bitcoin, blockchain, and digital asset space. I'm your host, Christine Lane. Joining me are my co-host, Quintus Managing Editor of Global Capital Markets, Lawrence Lewton, as well as Executive Director of Global Content, Emily Parker. Good morning, Emily and Lawrence. Good, Good morning. morning. All right, let's have a live look at Bitcoin. The coin is Bitcoin price XBX index currently at 44,039. Bitcoin is up just over 1% over the past 24 hours. The coin is Ether price ETX index is at 29.33. ETH is sliding back about six tenths of a percent. The DFX coin is DeFi index right now is at down about three and a half percent over the past 24 hours. The most reliable reference prices for institutions since 2014 are now published under the coin desk branch so globally as the leader in crypto news events and data. And so the war between Russia and Ukraine continues on. Russian forces are, are surrounding major key Ukrainian cities. The Ukrainian government has canceled a planned crypto airdrop as the Russian invasion continues. Mikhailo Fedorov, the vice prime minister of Ukraine, has been tweeting that after careful consideration, we decided to cancel airdropped. Every day, there are more and more people willing to help Ukraine to fight back the aggression. Instead, we will announce NFTs to support Ukrainian armed forces soon. We do not have any plans to issue any fungible tokens. All right, Emily, this is just really strange. First of all, it's the first in a nation state to do or to even suggest an airdrop, but, but now they want to do NFTs? Yeah, I don't know. It's really confusing. I mean, I think what seems to have happened is that, you know, Ukraine is one of the top countries in crypto adoption in the world. And it seems like the crypto segment of the government got kind of excited about legitimately, you know, something like $30 million, at least $30 million coming in via crypto donations, but maybe got a tad carried away maybe <laughs> with airdrops. And I think it got really complicated and they've decided, you know, there's an actual war going on. So maybe we should focus on that instead. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the NFT, uh, that's, that's pretty amazing. I mean, this is definitely a very new kind of uh, warfare. In, indeed, and you're taking the dynamics of crypto communities, network effects, and applying it in a time of war. We're seeing it in real time, how it's being done. In terms of the markets, Lawrence, what are you seeing? Right now, everything seems fairly flat uh, on the day. Uh, as, as you said, it's just up 1%. I, I took a look at some of the volumes over the past few days. Yes, it's up a little bit, but compared to where it was a few months ago even, it's still relatively light. Uh, yeah, I looked at the future volumes, uh, the outstanding future open interest. It's up a couple of billion dollars over the past uh, couple of days. However, it's still not where it was back in February. I mean, it, this is still a light market despite the warfare that's happening and despite this time of crisis and inflation and all these things. Um, it, it's very peculiar unless, that, unless it's also an indication that whatever happened a few months ago is something that... Uh, that was that was the extraordinary part, and that we're actually in a relatively normal market. We'll 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 see what happens over the next few weeks. Okay. Well, we'll dive further into the Russian-Ukraine crisis with our CoinDesk Spotlight. The CoinDesk Spotlight is brought to you by Nexo, the place to earn on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and more. So a growing chorus of policy policymakers are now calling for crypto regulations to ensure that digital assets are not being used to evade sanctions by Russian sanctioned officials. Uh, the question is, is crypto really an effective tool for this purpose? Uh, joining us to discuss this in further detail is Salman Banay, head of public policy in North America at the crypto analytics firm Chainalysis. Welcome, Salman. Good morning. Thanks for having me. So um, we're so happy to have you here because this has become such a hot topic and there's a lot of confusion about it. And Chainalysis is perfectly placed to really break this down in an understandable way. So first question is, this idea that <coughs> crypto could be used by Russia or by Russian officials or by sanctioned Russians to get around sanctions, is this really a real threat? I mean, is this something that could really happen or is it being overstated by people in Washington? Um, based based on our review of the data, it's it's it doesn't appear to be happening right now. And we think, given some structural features um, of the of the cryptocurrency blockchains, um, that we we think it's unlikely. Um, if it were to happen, um, it, the order of magnitude of liquidity that would be flowing into the cryptocurrency markets um, would be detectable, and um, it's the, the the type of thing we're we're on the lookout for. 
Thank you. That's a helpful data point. Could you help us, though, to, given that you have this unique perspective of actually, you know, looking at blockchain data, can you break down just in more detail what you mean when you say, you know, it can be detectable or you're not seeing it right now? Like, what exactly are you looking at? You know, how, how, how would you even, you know, how would you even see, right? You know, like when you say we're not seeing it right now, what, what, what are you doing? What are you using to make that determination? And just to break it down for like the wider audience that doesn't really understand yeah. how this works. Yeah, so in, in contrast to the traditional financial markets, which operate um, as a, a interaction between different databases, so one, one bank uh, credits, one bank debits, um, and that updates the databases at each, at each bank uh, based on a single wire transfer, um, and, and each one of those databases is, is um, you know, private, and opaque, um, only permission persons at those banks can see um, those account balances. Um, the open blockchain networks, um, they're, they're fully transparent. Anybody with internet access um, can see um, wallet addresses, um, tra the transaction ledger between wallet addresses. <clears throat> um, and so um, the, the nature of, of open blockchains makes it very um, useful for um, or, or, or readily um, visualizable um, by software platforms like the, the, the ones we offer. So we can actually trace transfers of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency in real time. In contrast, when it comes to traditional finance, um, those records have to be uh, produced. Um, they're often in different uh, reporting formats. So law enforcement investigators, sanctions investigators, um, it can take them uh, months, if not years, uh, to make progress um, on, a, on a given investigation. In contrast, uh, when it comes to open blockchains, um, you can see the, the transaction activity actually unfold in real time. Right. So, yeah, I think that's that's helpful. But, you know, given that there's so much confusion in Washington, I just want to push you a little bit further on that. So that's true. Sure. Right. We can see the, the flow of money in real time. But the burning question is, how do you how do you attribute that money to a particular person or a particular sanctioned individual? Right. That's the that's the question. So, I mean, if you could just give us like a for instance here, like how would you tie, you know, this flow of money or these because you can keep switching addresses and there's all sorts of things you can do. So how right. would you be able to, you know, figure out who's actually moving this money? and, you know, figure out that these are actually being moved by people that are not supposed to be moving this money? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's it's around monitoring the entry and exit points um, of, the, of, the, uh, of the blockchain. So what I'm, and, and that's usually in the form of exchanges where you can take your uh, fiat currency um, and, 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 and exchange it for crypto um, or, or vice versa. Um, and then... We, for example, when it comes to a ransomware hack, um, we will see a ransomware hacker. Uh, they, they they take their um, they take their uh, you know illicit gains, and it's transferred to to their wallet address. They they may disperse it. Um, they may try to use mixers in between. They may try to use DeFi protocols um, to try to obfuscate things. Um, but we've developed tools um, around uh, demixing. Um, around cross-chain monitoring, you know, some of the DeFi protocols you see um, operating that are used for obfuscation will transfer um, crypto from one, one token to another token. Um, these are all things that our tools um, can, can, can view and can monitor. Um, and then at some point, they're cashing out. And so we know um, we can identify which exchanges that they're using um, as cash out opportunities. Um, to provide a specific example, um, Suex and Chadex were a couple exchanges used uh, quite a bit by, by the Russians, um, were involved in um, some, some sanctions um, matters, uh, money laundering as well. And they were sanctioned by OFAC um, back in September. And we saw that immediately liquidity in, 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 in those two exchanges evaporated, so inbound uh, cryptocurrency transfers to those exchanges evaporated. So there's very good countermeasures um, at, that that the U.S. could could employ if we did start seeing sanctions evasion occurring um, on on the blockchain. So Salman, do you have sorry, a list? What do you mean evaporated? Of what, 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 I just sorry, I just thought, I'm, what do you mean evaporated? Like what what does that mean in this in this situation? Yeah. So those those exchanges, 
in inbound transfers of cryptocurrency just ceased. Someone do you have because list someone of... stopped them or because because so yeah so th th that's a good question so um, we we observed that um, inbound transfers of cryptocurrency went away um, we think it's because now all funds coming out of those exchanges in the crypto ecosystem are now tainted um, so I've I've used this metaphor of a uh, you know the the die packs um, that are uh, put on you know bundles of cash at at banks um, to prevent to deter uh, criminals from you know uh, robbing the bank. Um, much the same way, funds that come out of a sanctioned exchange are going to be tainted. Um, and given the traceability of the blockchain, um, they 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 can essentially be tainted forever. Um, and so that makes crypto coming out of those sanctioned exchanges um, non grata. Um, not, unacceptable for regulated exchanges, which is where the primary liquidity is uh, in, in the crypto markets. Sam, and I also saw some charts from Chainalysis, this one showing crypto exchange transaction volumes for the ruble and her Ukrainian hervinia. They've been surging amid the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, so does this data lend credence at all to the idea that crypto is being used possibly to avoid sanctions? What, how, do you, how are you reading this data? Yeah, so a couple of things about this data. Um, so, you know, each trade has two sides. So um, these this, this increase in volumes um, implies that there are people buying rubles and selling crypto and vice, vice versa. So somebody's taking the other side of the trade. So it's not just necessarily um, an info. Now, it's indicative of some increased demand uh, for these pairs, which could be indicative of, of, of some amount of inflow. Um, but based on the amounts we're seeing here, I mean, these, uh, you know, even if these were net inflows, um, you know, these amounts are, you know, in the, in the low tens of millions uh, per day, um, whereas the amount of Russian crude oil exports um, crude oil and petroleum exports amounts to somewhere around a billion dollars a day. So it's an order of magnitude um, greater um, than, you know, this 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 mild increase. Um, we, we think, um, and this is just an operating hypothesis at this point, we're, you know, always changing our hypothesis based on new data. <clears throat> but um, we, we see this uptick in activity probably linked to Russians, you know, everyday Russians, not Russian oligarchs uh, that have been sanctioned or the Russian state, but everyday Russians that are trying to preserve the value of their uh, of, of their of their um, household wealth. Interesting. And do you think that this Russia-Ukraine activity is driving the price of crypto? There's there's a, a lot of factors that go into crypto prices. I mean, um, you know, before um, before the uh, the Russian um, attack on Ukraine, um, it wouldn't be unusual to see you know Bitcoin go up. 10% or down 10% a day. Um, it's it's hard to say, uh, but it is something that we are we are we are looking at, um, and it it is it, we can't rule out that hypothesis. Um, it's certainly possible, but um, yeah, it's it's not something that we have a, a clear conclusion on yet. Uh, good morning, Salman. So, what do you think is the um easiest way for uh, a sanctioned individual to actually get around those sanctions that uh, in, in all of your analysis, you, you're showing kind of the ways in which it's being stopped. But are there any holes in, in that that you see potentially happening uh, that they can take advantage of? So, the you know, this is this is outside of uh, blockchain intelligence. But, um, you know, obviously we we're as we perform a risk assessment on um, the use of crypto, uh, for sanctions evasion, we have to look at the alternatives. Um, so the Russians have been subject to some amount of sanctions for several years at this point. Um, and uh, the people affiliated with the regime, the types of people that have gotten sanctioned in this in this initial round um, of sanctions are the kind of people that um, likely had, had had prepared for the for this eventuality. Um, the Russians have, um, in the past, developed uh, their own mechanisms, their own networks around money laundering. Um, so, if you Google Lush, the the Russian laundromat, um, you know there's a, there's a scheme from the the early 20 teens 
uh, where the Russians used a network of banks globally, um, mostly initiating their um, their money laundering through uh, bank banks in uh, Moldova. Um, but the, the network of laundered money extended into the U.S., um, you know, Western Europe, um, you know, pretty much uh, everywhere where there's a major banking center. Uh, so the Russians are very familiar with um, the traditional tools um, available to money launderers, the traditional banking system. Another thing that we are uh, we are seeing is um, it looks like Russians, the Russians had been increasingly over the past several years, uh, shifting away from the U.S. dollar as the um, as the currency used for their exports, their their largest, um, you know, their 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 primary source of uh, foreign foreign currency would be you know crude oil. And petroleum products, which, uh, as I mentioned, about a billion dollars a day in exports at current prices, and um, they've been shifting. In, in particular, there's a not- noticeable pattern toward um, the yuan. Um, and uh, there, were, there were press reports, I believe, last week, indicating that Chinese banks um, were going to or are, are uh, cutting off acts, uh, letters of credit, uh, credit support for Russian exports denominated in U.S. dollars. Uh, but they will allow it in the Chinese yuan. So um, I think when it comes to large scale, you, you, you know, sanctions evasion, um, traditional money laundering networks, as well as shifting activity to um, the yuan and other currencies um, are, are still probably the two more attractive ways the Russians are, are going to use to, uh, to evade sanctions. So how, how much are we talking about in size uh, in terms of sanctioned crypto account, uh, wallets, et cetera? Uh, how, how much are they, number one? Number two, kind of a, uh, a going off of what you were saying earlier just now a, a, about um, using the, the Chinese yuan for uh, evading and, and for uh, denominating the, the exports. Do you think that will have a long-term impact, for instance, on certain stable coins in the denominated in the U.S. as, as those uh, yuan go in, uh, if you will, uh, it, you know, people need to recycle it and, and change the exposure. Do you think that that might lead to, a, to an uptick in, for instance, eventually U.S. dollar denominated stable coins? Yeah. So on, on the first point, um, there have been no new sanctions designations at a crypto wallet address level in connection with this latest round of uh, sanctions um, yet. Um, so th- there's that. Now, there there are, um, I think, um, OFAC, um, the Office of Foreign Asset Control of, uh, of the United, United States, uh, inside the U- United States Treasury, um, they've sanctioned, I believe, around um, just around 100, give or take, uh, wallet addresses. I don't know what their those wallet addresses, what their balances are right now, um, but um, our, our data does show that um, the ability of those sanctions, those sanctioned wallet addresses to um, seek liquidity has been seriously hampered uh, as a function of, uh, of, of, of sanctions. Um, on, on the point around um, that what the shift to the yuan might mean for the cryptocurrency or, or the stablecoin markets, that's uh, that's too soon to, to, to see. I mean, I, I think an interesting um, dynamic that we haven't seen yet is um, a shift, uh, not just to the, to, the, to the yuan, but to the digital yuan, um, which, um, you know, launched, uh, you know, earlier this year. So uh, that, that's something that I think um, a lot of us are, our monitoring are going to be interested to see whether um, the digital yuan actually uh, participates um, as a part of the the, the Russians' uh, you know reaction against these sanctions. Finally, when we look at the Ukraine wallets, uh, they the Ukrainian government has issued a number of wallet addresses asking for donations. Are you tracking those at all? The amounts that are coming in, where they're coming from, and uh, any on-chain data insights that you find interesting. Uh, not yet. I mean, I think the, the press has covered this uh, pretty well. I mean, I, I think it's in the uh, the, the mid mid uh, tens of millions at this point. Uh, last last I checked. Um, question we get asked a lot is, um, you know, why is Ukraine, um, uh, you know, using uh, cryptocurrency uh, for people that want to help help them? Um, and one thing our data shows is that 
Ukraine is actually fairly advanced when it comes to adopting crypto. Actually, they're number four in the world globally um, when it comes to cryptocurrency um, adoption. So a lot of Ukrainians um, have mobile phones with wallets or accounts on centralized exchanges. And so they have the infrastructure um, in place to distribute cryptocurrency uh, to a lot of the people that are being uh, negatively affected by um, this, uh, th this war. Interesting. Salman, thank you so much for your instance. Appreciate you coming onto the show. Thanks for having me. That was Chain Alice's head of public policy in North America, Salman Benai. Coming up, crypto markets update with technical advisory firm, The Markets Compass. Hey, I'm Isaiah Jackson, host of Community Crypto and author of Bitcoin and Black America. You're watching Coindesk TV. Checking in on Bitcoin, the Coindesk Bitcoin price XBX index currently at 44,043. Bitcoin slightly up about nine tenths of a percent over the past 24 hours. The Coindesk Ether price ETX index is at 29.33, sliding down about eight tenths of a percent. And the new DFX Coindesk DeFi index is at 265, also tracking losses about three and a half percent. The Crypto Markets Update is brought to you by KuCoin, the best place to find the next crypto gem. Bitcoin is up about $8,000 over the past week. That's about 20 some odd percent over the, over the past week. So will that continue? Joining us now to discuss crypto markets is Timothy Brackett. He's CEO of the Market Compass and Managing Director of Technical Research at Market Field Asset Management. Welcome, Timothy. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So you, Thank you, for you brought me. some charts with you. Yes, you I brought did. Some charts. As a matter of fact, great. I, I so there's this. The first chart I want to look at is one that's a, it's it's a short term Bitcoin chart, and you see us breaking out of a, a technical channel, uh, and we're now hitting resistance at about forty five, four fifty or so. Uh, what exactly is going on there? Do you think that this is that level will will sustain as a as a resistance, or you think we'll break through it? I think we'll break through it. Um, and as you can see from the first, uh, the lower panels, uh, the top one and the second one are both oscillators uh, that are showing a change in momentum that are confirming that break out of the channel, which actually is not exactly a channel. It is uh, referred to as Andrew's pitchfork, median line analysis. But it essentially tells the same story. On the very bottom is uh, Bitcoin relative to my uh, to my crypto index, which is uh, a market weighted index of the top eight cryptocurrencies. And relative, it's acting fabulous. I, I think, have, as you have, had said before. Just to clarify quickly, you had said things have gotten very quiet. And I think that's part of a crabbing along base building kind of thing and that higher prices are to come and that the corrective phase is over. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll get to the crypto index in a second, because I, I actually first want to look at this other chart that you have. It's, it shows the three uh, it, it shows three humps, if you will. But it's actually it, it's kind of like a, an, an, a, a, a combination chart where you see again it's i guess that would be another pitchfork uh, design here um but you you see us uh, kind of bouncing off that lower 38900 uh support so that that's a what would confirm that this isn't in, in fact what's happening in the market what what do you think will what, what indicator will you see uh, saying that yes this is in fact the way the market will head over the next couple of years uh 
uh, over the next couple of years, anything well, uh, can over, happen. At least the longer term. Oh, over the longer okay. term. I, I figured, I, I assume happen. that's what you meant. Um, yeah. In the, the, the middle panel is uh, a proprietary indicator that I've developed an oscillator. It's very similar to what is known as the RSI. Um, and it trades in bands. In bull markets, it trades between uh, the uh, two green lines. Um, the colors have changed because you have a black background. Right. But it is holding, the, the, the weekly chart is holding the bull band. And uh, that gives me confidence, as well as the fact that in behind, you see what is referred to as a cloud chart, and it is holding in the cloud. Now, your crypto index chart, it looks a little bit more bearish, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. It, it's, uh, so this is the top eight cryptos that, that you're looking at in, in one index. Um, so is this, in fact, a bearish chart, or am I, am I misreading it, or, or do you have any indication that, uh, that it'll break out above that, that uh, upward resistance, that, I, that line that we see there? Yeah, the upper parallel of the uh, of the pitchfork. No, I don't. I don't see this as particularly bearish. In fact, if you refer to the MC oscillator below, you'll see that when it made its second bottom, there was a higher level of momentum, which I find to be very positive. Uh, positive, and I am cautiously optimistic that this is a very positive sign. Below that is the Fisher transform which is a very complicated, I did not create yeah. that. Uh, but the Fisher transform suggests that uh, that was a very important pivot at the second low and that uh, it's that gonna was, find a momentum to get to keep going. Go ahead. That, that, that pivot you're seeing is uh, February 22nd, right? That's when, that's when things started to turn around there with, with the Fisher. Exactly, exactly. Okay. I, I, I use a, a, a toolbox of maybe a dozen indicators, although, as you know, as a technician, there are hundreds of indicators <laughs> that can be used. But Timothy, I try to keep it simple. You're looking price, at this data truth. rather positively. I wonder what kind of catalysts, macro catalysts, are driving this story that you believe, in your view, will see Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies rise in the coming months? Well, it, all I can refer to, and I ignore fundamentals totally. The only thing that I can say is, is I have a, I think the odds favor that the equity markets, including the very important tech sector, has likely put in an, an important bottom, an important temporary bottom, and that the correction is, for the time being, complete. Last Thursday, uh, the reversal in the equity markets was very impressive, including the uh, including the follow through on Friday. And I so think, as happen, far as macro, go ahead. I was going to ask, you know, what would happen in the equity markets to change that opinion? Uh, you know, what, what kind of what kind of relationship do you see? Uh, breaking down, or, or would that relationship necessarily break down? Do you think, or do you think that that the connection between the two markets would persist, including if something were to change in the equity markets? Well, as you know, correlations are very important, and I look at them. But correlations change over time as the market builds and decays. I uh, I just tr I try to uh, avoid join correlations, but it would seem to me that if technology has found a bottom, that it could be a tailwind for crypto. All right, Timothy, thanks for reading the tea leaves for us. Appreciate your insights. That was the Markets Compass CEO, Timothy Brackett. Coming up, checking in with Coindesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor, Dick Day.
Welcome back. Let's say hello to Coindesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor Nick Day, who's also the editor of Coindesk's The State of Crypto Newsletter. Good morning, Nick. Good morning. So, can the IRS tax rewards earned by crypto stakers? It's a question they don't want to go to trial for, apparently. Yeah, so just a quick bit of background. Uh, you know, you may remember we were talking in February about a IRS case two individuals who were staking onto Tesla's blockchain sued the IRS on, you know, for a refund of the income tax that they charged uh, on the cryptos they earned through staking. Now, at the time, uh, the IRS offered a settlement and uh, offered to refund the two individuals. The two individuals said that they would refuse to accept the refund, uh, the refund because they wanted to force a court decision. The IRS filed this week and said that, well, they sent the refund anyway. The court case is over. There is uh, no grounds for it to continue. And uh, therefore, you know, they don't want to deal with uh, this being, you know, perceived as a uh, shift in policy or anything like that. They, they're they just trying to move end litigation, move on. Interesting. Meanwhile, this is open the door. I was just going to ask, does this open the door for other people to try the same tactic uh, and, and to see if they can force the IRS's uh, hand here with, with the courts? It's very likely. So the IRS in its arguments said that uh, they don't see this as being, uh, you know, something that you can really take to trial because every year is a new tax year and therefore, you know, it'd be a new suit every year. Um, if one per, you know, person or party were to file multiple suits over several years, then perhaps they might have a chance. But at least for now, it seems, you know, this is a non-starter. Meanwhile, the SEC is investigating whether certain NFTs qualify as securities, according to Bloomberg, right? Right. So we're talking about fractionalized NFTs here. So, uh, you know, fractionalized NFTs have been this thing where instead of one whole NFT, people are saying like, OK, well, you own you know a part of this and it'll give you like X amount of rights, but only for like, you know, Y amount of days or, you know, however they're divvying that up. And uh the IRS is basically looking to see if this is, you know, some kind of common enterprise type situation where you have, uh, you know, like an ICO where uh, you have people getting uh, some sort of rights conferred by these tokens that they might not otherwise have or that, you know, would normally be registered under securities law if it was a non-crypto project. And finally, you have some further insights into why Ukraine canceled their airdrop of tokens from donators. Uh, so. Not so much insights, but it does seem that, you know, it, this was canceled this morning. Um, the Minister for Digital Transformation announced the move on Twitter after a lot of speculation and after a lot of uh, work by um, various people to try and, you know, sort out what exactly was happening. Now, the really, really interesting part is, you know, the government of Ukraine tweeted there would be an airdrop yesterday, but we got like zero details. So, you know, we didn't know what chains this might be on. We didn't know, you know, what exactly the plan was. And that did lead to a lot of, uh, you know, speculation and uncertainty and even some backlash from individuals who were concerned it might not be on their preferred chain. <laughs> I wonder who. I, I My uh, question too is that you had some scam, uh, it seems like some scam accounts, of course, promising uh airdrops according uh, uh related to this correct uh th this kind of of course happens in crypto all the time so spoofs and what have you that that also happened correct right and uh, you know in the absence of information it becomes really easy to you know set up a scam account or to you know find ways of manipulating you know certain tokens to make it seem as if they might be the preferred uh you know, or the token that will be involved. And uh, unfortunately, it does seem to have happened this time. All right, Nick. Thanks for the update. That was Coinus Managing Editor of Global Policy and Regulation, Nick Day. Don't forget to sign up for the State of Crypto newsletter on Coindesk.com. Time to check in with Crypto Twitter for our tweet of the day. So Nick mentioned some backlash against the airdrop. And when some of that backlash came from Justin Sun, the founder of Tron, tweeting, Tron community are continuing to support Ukraine, even though they are excluding Tron from the airdrop. This is before the airdrop was announced, canceled. 
Nevertheless, now the amount is more than $1.3 million, but it is just unfair to exclude them. Every donation should be treated equally. Now, this was roundly condemned on Twitter. It's not a good look, obviously, when donating to a country and then asking, where's mine, when said country is being bombed, occupied, and brought to its knees with war. But Emily, you think that there's more nuance to this? Well, I, I do think that this tweet was probably not phrased very well. Um, I, you know, I, Justin is operating in a kind of interesting environment because he's not only very well known here in the U.S., he's also very, very well known in China. And in China, um, opinions on Ukraine and Russia are quite, public opinion is quite different than it is here in the United States. So, you know, he's trying to walk this balance uh, in China specifically about like not being seen as, you know, too pro-Ukraine and uh, trying to, you know, kind of play both sides. But anyway, I I think it's fair to say that, you know, given that we are in the middle of a war or not we, but given that, you know, Ukraine and Russia are in the middle of a war, this is not um, this is probably not the, the right tone. They should give it to him on a on a hard drive, uh, on a little flash drive in, in Kiev. You can go pick it up. <laughs> well, he expressed some he was pleased that the airdrop was canceled. Maybe he'll get some NFTs. All right, that's it for First Mover. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Lawrence. I'm your host, Christine Lee. Meantime, check out the hash at noon Eastern and all about Bitcoin with yours truly at 3 o'clock. You're watching Coindesk TV. And next up, stay tuned for The Daily Forecast to see what's happening in the Asia crypto markets. The ground war is intensifying in Ukraine. How crypto is playing an important part. Will it make a difference? Welcome to The Daily Forecast, March 3rd, 2022. I'm Angie Lau, Editor-in-Chief of Forecast, covering all things blockchain. Well, the whole world is watching, and many crypto exchanges have been asked to step in and restrict users. In South Korea, we're seeing that play out, where assets of Russians are being targeted. We're going to take a look at that, plus a whole lot more coming up. Let's get you up to speed from Asia to the world. Join thousands of NFT traders who already start their day on Crypto Slam. Well, let's start with an update on the latest moves from the crypto space around the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. According to blockchain analysis firm Elliptic, donations continue to pour into Ukraine to the tune of nearly 47 million US dollars since the beginning of the Russian invasion. And crypto exchange blockchain.com showed that Ukraine government wallets for crypto donations have so far collected over 10 million dollars in Bitcoin and around $15.3 million worth in Ethereum. Meanwhile, a South Korean crypto exchange has made a move to freeze the accounts of Russian users. According to local media, GoPax has frozen around 20 accounts, with the exchange saying that the action aligns with the U.S. Office of Foreign Assets Control and the European Union's sanctions against Russia. 20 may not seem like many. However, that's because many Korean exchanges have already restricted access to foreign investors over money laundering concerns. Meanwhile, Hong Kong-based Animoca Brands is also among Asian firms to stop serving Russian users. However, not all exchanges share the sentiment. Binance and Kraken have both said they will not freeze user accounts as they go against the philosophy of decentralized and distributed access of crypto. You can find those stories and more at forecast.news. Over in China, we are watching the implications of the country's most important annual political meeting very closely here. The two sessions begin Friday with authorities laying out China's economic and social plans for the year ahead. Now, progress on the ECNY, blockchain technology and digital infrastructure are all expected to be featured. But could the situation in Ukraine also be on the agenda? And what's China's stance on that? Forecast's Timmy Shen has more on what to watch out for. The two sessions will see Chinese Premier Li Keqiang deliver a work report to the National People's Congress, reviewing last year's performance and setting new policy directives for 2022. And at the same time, the National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which is an advisory body consisting of industry leaders and party delegates, holds its annual meeting. The digital yuan is expected to be high on the agenda following its showcase to a global audience of athletes and diplomats at the Winter Olympics last month. 
Amnon's summit of cybersecurity company Bitment, which has led CBDC trials for China since 2018, told Forecast he expects greater financial support for smaller players to be announced, and that making the ECNY programmable could make it the perfect tool to support small enterprises. Meanwhile, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has led to greater publicity for China's central bank digital currency, with one expert saying it could partially shield the country from the financial restraints Russia is facing, which include the widening ban on access to the SWIFT network for Russian banks. Shanghai-based fintech consultant Richard Turin told Forecast he expects a carefully worded statement that recognizes the strategy of building a currency that is immune from global interference without referencing the conflict. Turin says he expects a greater urgency to launch the ECNY domestically, as well as newfound importance in its international use as a result of the sanctions. Other items to look out for are more details on China's blockchain goals, which could include development of smart contracts, while David Roach of the Independent Strategy expects regulation of the metaverse, digital finance, and cryptocurrency sectors to be maintained, but possibly with less active intervention. For Forecast, I'm Timmy Shan, Taipei, Taiwan. And finally today, making a career in blockchain. That's what we're seeing in India, where demand for tailor-made blockchain courses is soaring. An entire generation is shifting focus to this technology, and many are starting to wonder if India could become the new blockchain Silicon Valley. Question is, will the country even support it? Forecasts Pradeepta Mukherjee reports from Calcutta, India. While the Indian government still hasn't committed to clarity over the legality of cryptocurrencies as a whole, the Reserve Bank of India has been tasked with introducing a central bank digital currency. That means blockchain professionals are becoming valuable resources in both the public and private sectors. And that's led to an explosion in the number of courses in the subject being offered by India's leading educational institutions. The Indian Institute of Technology in Kharagpur is just one of them, offering a free 12-week online course on blockchain, and it's clearly popular with almost 28,000 students enrolled. Many people, they want to do it. Uh, so at least for the next few years, uh, I, I, I feel that this interest will come. And, and as in India, we are trying to build up new technologies, new system with the help of blockchain, and we actually need manpower, or train manpower can help us in developing this kind of technologies. He is definitely right about the need for manpower. Over 11,000 blockchain-related jobs are currently being advertised on LinkedIn in India, while local job portal Nokri.com currently shows over 110,000 blockchain-related job listings. And it's not just those already in school or university who are looking to develop their blockchain knowledge. Traditional investors who are worried about getting left behind are enrolling too. One 35-year-old entrepreneur and investor told Forecast why he's going back to school. I'm learning about cryptocurrency and blockchain uh, to know more about the subject before I invest. And also I want to learn because a lot of scams are happening around Bitcoin in India. So, and before I invest into it, I want to have more information and more knowledge. However, while such courses may bring students up to speed, one expert is not certain they will find all opportunities in India. We must also keep in mind that the Indian market in cryptocurrencies is fractured. It's not perfect. It's perhaps a little behind the rest of the world. And therefore, for students to find all the opportunities may not be possible in India. But Guptu thinks that's only a short-term problem and things could change rapidly if situations change in India. So maybe those future Silicon Valley dreams will come true. For Forecast, I am Pradeepta Mukherjee, Kolkata, India. And that's The Daily Forecast, bringing you all the key updates from the blockchain space from our vantage point right here in Asia. For more, visit forecast.news. I'm Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. Until the next time.